the gallery at the George Peabody Library. My name is Sam Besson. I'm the curator of sheet music and popular culture here at the Sheridan Libraries. And I'm also the curator of this exhibition, Grace Notes in American History, which is on view here from March 15th through July 31st of 2022. Today I'm going to be giving you a quick tour of the exhibition and showing you a couple of my favorite things. But the exhibit in general is an exploration of our sheet music collections, and in particular how sheet music has been a part of American popular culture. So it ranges from social media and advertising, uh, propaganda, through of course entertainment and popular culture. So one of my favorite objects is behind me here. Uh, this is obviously not sheet music. This is a really beautiful grand piano built by Kanabe and Co. here in Baltimore in 1899. Now, Kanabe pianos are not as well known as, say, Steinway, but they were one of Steinway's big rivals in producing the most beautiful looking and sounding pianos. If you look over here, we have a case that shows you how sheet music has been historically made, ranging from lithography and engraving to even movable type. So, for example, here are a couple of song sheets. Now, as you can see, these are not as large as typical sheet music, they have no musical notation on them. So they were both easier to produce and a little bit easier to read for those who could not read musical notation. Instead, they have the lyrics printed on them, and they list a well-known tune, something that many people would have known, like Yankee Doodle, for example, so that anyone who had this could apply the lyrics to the tune. So the main sheet music collection that is featured in this exhibition is the Lester Levy Sheet Music Collection. This is really one of the largest digitized sheet music collections in the world. It contains about 30,000 songs that range from around the 1770s all the way up through the 1970s. Now, Lester Levy worked for his family hat business, MS Levy and Sons, here in Baltimore. And as he would travel the United States as a salesman for the company, he would stop at antique stores to purchase sheet music. He also received music at auction or with his group of sheet music collecting friends. So around me are a couple of objects that showcase uh, not only how he collected these songs, but how he showed them to the public. He gave many speeches, lectures, exhibitions, tours. He was very passionate about, about getting his sheet music into the public. One of my favorite stories here is this one. This is where Lester is writing to Susan Colgan, who is a book publisher, and he's telling her the story of how he obtained his first edition of the Star Spangled Banner, which is really one of the rarest and most valuable songs ever printed in the United States. Levy uh, was looking to purchase the Star Spangled Banner for quite a while, and he learned that there was a gentleman staying at a hotel in Maryland who had a copy. So he met with this person, purchased the banner, but noticed that it looked like it had been torn out of a larger book. On his way home, he stopped at an antique store and found that the banner had actually been stolen from a book there earlier that morning. So he very dutifully returned the song to the owner and eventually re repurchased it back. Levy was also very unafraid to write to celebrities at the time, like Ira Gershwin and Irving Berlin, and he leveraged his uh, experience making hats by offering to make Irving Berlin and Ira Gershwin custom hats. Uh, so because of this, we have quite a few letters between Levy and these celebrities, but also many signed songs by them. So for example, here are letters from Irving Berlin and Ira Gershwin that are thanking Levy for the wonderful hats that he made for them. We also have a song, or I'm sorry, a um, letter from Arthur Fiedler, who was the conductor of the Boston Pops Orchestra. And in this letter, he writes to Levy asking for advice and information about the Star Spangled Banner. So it really just illustrates how much of an authority Levy was on music. So we have many, many songs in the Levy collection that have autographs on them. In most cases, the autograph is simply from somebody who owned the sheet music at one point, much like we might write our name inside of our favorite book. But we do have many famous autographs in the collection, and these are a couple of my favorites. So you can see on the top, we have a song called Lady Lindy, We're All For You. And it's difficult to see, but the song is actually signed by Amelia Earhart. So this was published just around the time that she became the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. In this case, it was as a passenger, but of course she would go on to do the trip solo. As I mentioned, we also have many songs uh, autographed by Ira Gershwin. So if you look in the middle here, we have I Got Rhythm, which is one of their most famous songs. And he's even included a personal note to Lester Levy here, explaining that it took him many weeks to write the lyric for this song. Apparently it was very difficult. We also have over here a very strange manuscript. Now I found this manuscript as I was planning this exhibition, and it claims to be penned by Edgar Allan Poe. 
If it's real, which is to be determined, it would be the only known example of musical notation in Poe's handwriting, which is substantial. However, the ink is slightly suspicious, the paper is slightly suspicious, and even the handwriting is a little bit suspicious. So we're treating this document as a likely forgery, but it's still very fascinating. Um, and so here we have a couple of items that provide a bit more context to it. For example, the song that I was likely copied from, the letter from George Wright who claimed to have found the manuscript in 1939, and a book that mentions, mentions the manuscript in 1939 as well. So this case here features songs from the Harlem Renaissance in New York and includes artists like Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Langston Hughes, and also Baltimore's own U.B. Blake. For example, we have a song here from Shuffle Along by U.B. Blake and Noble Sissel. Shuffle Along was the first uh, Broadway hit to feature an all-black creative team and cast. So these songs were also published in New York City. These are from what's known as the Tin Pan Alley era of sheet music history. So Tin Pan Alley was first and foremost a place, it was 28th Street in New York City, where you had all of these sheet music publishers crammed into these brownstones competing with each other. But it's also representative of an era of sheet music history in New York City, where you had hyper competition, but also mass production of sheet music. So a lot of what we know now as the Great American Songbook came from this era of sheet music history. So for example, we have songs like Take Me Out to the Ball Game. We also have Over There by George M. Cohan from the First World War. We have Come Josephine and My Flying Machine, Let's Call the Whole Thing Off, and also Alexander's Ragtime Band by Irving Berlin. Right now I am situated in front of what is probably my favorite wall of the entire exhibit. This is a wall that I call Colorful Covers. I pick these songs because to me they are the most beautiful, visually interesting, uh, ornate, and a lot of sheet music was displayed in window displays, much like we might see at a department store nowadays. So publishers went through a lot of effort to compete with each other for our attention. So you can see some of these use very bright colors, some of them might have a celebrity endorsement on them, um, but you probably recognize some of these here, such as I Have Confidence from The Sound of Music or Over the Rainbow from The Wizard of Oz. I'm also situated between two cases that are sort of polar opposites. So to my left here, we have Songs of Love, and to my right, we have Songs of War. One very interesting song from here is The Wedding March from Mendelssohn's Midsummer Night's Dream. This is still used today uh, as a processional for weddings, but it's also a really great example of the importation of sheet music from Europe to the United States. We have quite a bit of music in the Levy collection from war. We actually have, in this case, what is the, the earliest dated song in the Levy collection. We have many undated songs, but this one called The Good Subjects of Old England is the earliest with a date printed on it, which is 1779. And this is kind of a hilarious song that is uh, published in England during the Revolutionary War as sort of this anti-American song saying, we must be good subjects, we must be good subjects. We also have a song from the Civil War here called Home Sweet Home that was reportedly sung by both soldiers of the Union and the Confederacy, sometimes at the same time across battle lines. And it was even reportedly banned by the Union Army for fear of making soldiers so homesick that they might desert the army. We also have a collection of songs here called the Army Navy Hit Kits that were distributed directly to soldiers during the Second World War with simplified piano parts, allowing them to make their own music uh, as a source of morale. These two cases showcase a variety of music that was either published in Baltimore or about Baltimore. So on the left here, we have a collection of songs that were lithographed at Hone & Co, whose building actually still stands in East Baltimore. A lithograph is basically where you will take a, an oily pencil and draw a design on a stone, like the one over here to my right. You would then dampen the stone with water so that any oil-based ink you apply afterwards would stick to the oily pencil, but not the water, because oil and water don't mix. So you can see you were able to produce quite a lot of detail with a lithograph. So this one called Fifth Regiment March actually shows the Washington Monument, which is just outside the doors here. We also have songs published about Baltimore. So for example, this is Our Orioles March, published in 1894, and it actually lists the whole team from that year. We have a song called Argonaut, about a submarine that was produced in Baltimore. But one of my favorite songs here is down at the bottom called God Bless the Child, 
uh, which is by Billie Holiday, but in this case recorded by Ethel Ennis, who was a local jazz star who we are actually currently processing her collection of sheet music. So these final two cases in the exhibit feature music from four protest movements. The first to my right is emancipation. We also have suffrage, temperance, or abstinence from drugs and alcohol, and finally labor. Now all of these songs use imagery on the cover, but also music to stir up passion for the cause. So one uh, particularly powerful song here is Oh Let My People Go. Uh, this is one of the earliest known spirituals that originated in enslaved communities. And this particular version is one of the earliest, if not the first, published in sheet music form. We also have here suffrage, temperance, and labor. And on the left, I've placed one pro song, and on the right, one anti song. So for example, with suffrage, we have the suffrage march here, which includes a really amazing call to action on the inside cover. And then we also have the anti-suffrage rose, which as you can see is published by the Women's Anti-Suffrage Association. On the left here, we have Every Day Will Be Sunday When the Town Goes Dry. This was published during Prohibition in New York City. And you can see this gentleman sadly watching his one beer fly away from him. As opposed to that, we have All Marry No Man If He Drinks by Mrs. E.A. Parkhurst. And at the bottom here, we have a song called Stick to the Union Jack, which has a couple of cartoons on the cover that show Jack, the main character of the song, who acts as a scab. He crosses a picket line during a protest, and as a result, he is shunned by his friends and colleagues. And then we have uh, an alternative song, Ruined Through the Strike, which aims to scare people away from participating in strikes by telling the story of a protester that's shot by the police. Now, the music that we don't have on display in this exhibition uh, is part of the difficult history of the Levy Collection, and it's explained on the, the, te the text panel behind me. Lester Levy collected songs from, of course, vaudeville and Broadway, but he also sought to collect music from the darker corners of our popular culture so that students, researchers, and scholars could confront them. In particular, we have quite a bit of minstrel music, uh, and by minstrelsy, I'm referring to a very racist form of entertainment in which white performers would put on blackface and satirize African Americans, immigrants, Jews, and Native Americans. We felt like instead of putting these songs on display uh, where they could be glorified or potentially traumatic, we decided to contextualize them in a digital exhibition that you can see here to my left. On this digital exhibition, you can explore the darker corners of the collection, but you can also see sheet music for any of the songs on display. Um, you can pull this up on your own device and access a playlist of songs, um, and you can generally find expanded descriptions. So that concludes our tour. Thanks so much for joining me, and I hope to see you here in person. This exhibit is on display from March 15th through July 31st of 2022.